And remember, at 1010, they would like for the kids. And uh, if you've not been a part of the practice, well, you go anyway and sing and learn the chorus real fast. So special music during the next hour from our children. I did have a couple of other prayer requests that I forgot or wasn't aware of. One is we do not have any more details other than we just heard that on Friday we believe that Doc Byram from Logansport, the vet, had a heart attack and he is down at the hospital in Lafayette. So we believe Doc Byram is recovering from a heart attack. And then someone might help me with the first name for certain, but we believe it is Caleb, but the last name is Graf, and perhaps you saw the story or heard it. Um, a young a freshman in college. Huh? Oh, Jacob. All right, let's get rid of Caleb and put in Jacob. And pray for his family. That um, will be this afternoon, the, the viewing and the service will be on Monday morning. It's really uh, shaken the whole town of Logansport. Again, a freshman in college, a great athlete in, the, in, the, in cross country and track from our community. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, Monday viewing, funeral Tuesday. So some of you who know that family or are just sensitive to the issue, be sure to pray for him. All right, this is our final message dealing with a really important theme, a clear conscience. Now I'm going to tell the story. Now every time I tell a story that's connected to something that really happened in my family, I, I'm told afterwards, Dad, you didn't get it right. So this may not be right. And I've told it before, but it is such a powerful illustration. In fact, I shared it with a uh, person this week, encouraging the individual to go through and take inventory of your life Go as deep as you need to go and, and ask the Lord to reveal to you, are there any issues in my life that are unresolved? Is there any sin that is unconfessed? Because we're looking at the benefits of maintaining a clear conscience. So here's the story as I remember it, which, you know, at a certain age, it can morph into all kinds of things. But as I remember it, Danielle was here in between attending two different colleges. She was working at the bank. They had insurance. It was a great opportunity. She went to the dentist and, you know, had teeth cleaned and all of that. Well, they found one tooth. I believe it was up on the top of her jaw. And they had to go in and go down into the root, you know, and take that out and, and fill it all up. And the tooth was perfect. It was in the back. She was glad to have it done. Later that next school year, she started indicating in our phone calls, well, I got a tooth that's bothering me. Pretty soon it was my jaw is hurting all the time. Pretty soon it was I can't even move my neck. I can't sleep. And we said, Danielle, you need to go to a dentist. Well, I just had all my teeth looked at. She goes to the dentist. He does the x-ray and found out that when the tooth was cleaned, apparently they did not get all of the infection out of it, all of the decay out of it. So now, because it was not real from the roots to the jawline, now the cavity was growing up into her jawbone. And the reason she was having all that pain was because it was forced to grow in an awkward direction. And the dentist said, we've got to take care of this. You know, it's right close to your sinus cavities, close to your brain, and that infection could really become a critical situation. Well, the dentist did all that and did the work well, and that took care of it. I have referenced that event 
on many, many, many occasions because what happened to her with her teeth often happens with individuals in regards to their soul, their, their heart, their mind. There is something that they just have not dealt with in a biblical fashion. And because of that, instead of it just going away because we're ignoring it, quite honestly, it just gets worse and it begins to drift into other areas of our life. Now, sometimes we are, I mean, the heart is deceitful and who can know it? Sometimes we can't find out what's wrong because we've spent so many years justifying, making excuses for our action, our behavior, our attitude. But when the Holy Spirit begins to do the work, it's a little bit like the dentist with that sharp tool and he points into a weak spot and wiggles it around and then he'll ask, does that hurt? He really doesn't need to ask that question because if it hurts, he knows. Because you suck in the air and you shake your head a little bit. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He brings into our lives conviction. And the purpose is always to bring us back into a rich fellowship with our Father, our Heavenly Father and our Savior. So that's the Holy Spirit's work. Let's take a look at the benefits of a clear conscience. Why we need to maintain a clear conscience. A clear conscience enables us to live in harmony with God and men. So that's what we're aiming at. So I have here just some verses and some statements. We'll go through them and and consider how they apply to our lives in, in this day. Paul is a great example in so many ways. And here we find him giving his testimony in Acts chapter 23. He makes a statement that I could not make. Oh, I I, I just am not able to make this statement. But he's gazing intently at the high council. Paul began, brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Don't we know that awful feeling when you are being convicted and you keep you've done the same thing that I've done it comes to mind and you push it away it comes back you try to rationalize it you come it comes back after you've pushed it away again and now pretty soon it's in your thoughts all the time as we saw some weeks ago that your conscience is what puts you to bed every night And it's what wakes you up in the morning. And that's the way it is. It's with you all day long. And the more you try to push it away, the greater the conviction becomes. I've shared with you before on occasions that I have been convicted. And it's to the point where I know I need to write a letter to make a situation right. And it's taken me oftentimes two weeks to write the letter because I just wrestle with it. But when you do what the Holy Spirit of God is asking you to do, all of a sudden you go, oh, good. I don't have to carry that burden of guilt or shame any longer. So Paul says, hey, listen. This is my testimony. This has been the focus of my life, to have a clear conscience before God. A little later in uh, chapter 24, he says this, Because of this, I always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. We've said it before, but it's cute with a kid, but... It's not so cute when it's us, and it is often us. You know when your kids or your grandkids have done something wrong. You know if somebody in your classroom has done something wrong, because if you look at them for more than just a passing second, they say things like this, quit staring at me. I didn't do anything. I mean, they confess without confessing. Have you ever felt that in your own life? 
when you walk into a room or maybe you've said, I don't want to go to that particular party. I don't want to go to that particular event. There are people there and when they look at me, it's as if they can look right through me and see my sin. So Paul says this is most important that we try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. So, a number of statements. We have five that I'd like for you to consider. And this comes from a basic seminar textbook. This was an organization that had great influence in the Christian community. They did have some problems with the leadership of this ministry. And because of that, some have discounted its value. But let's face it. Don't you have a little trouble with the way your life is going on part of the week often? So we can't throw out all the good information because of, a, of the failure of a few key people. So let's continue. Statement number one, a healthy conscience discerns between good and evil, and it gets weighed down with guilt over wrongdoing. This sense of guilt should motivate you to take responsibility for your actions and seek forgiveness when you have done something wrong. You will gain a clear conscience when your sin is pardoned and its accompanying guilt is resolved through genuine repentance. We've introduced that. Let's look at statement number two. A clear conscience prompts you to live honorably in order to avoid the painful consequences of sin and the humiliation of confessing wrongdoing, asking for forgiveness, and making restitution. So often, as we have seen over the last few, well, several weeks where we've talked about this, that we resist, we resist, we resist, and then finally when we confess it, we shout out with joy the way David did when he said in Psalms 32, 5, finally I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me all my guilt is gone what a great statement that we can say grace is so abundant mercy flows so freely motivated by God's everlasting love that when I come with humility with sincerity and I confess my sin, I am forgiven. What an incredible promise we have in the scriptures. David felt the burden because he was guilty of not only the death of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, but for all those others who were pressed to the front when the general knew they would die a senseless death. He had the shame of the relationship with Bathsheba, of destroying a family, of making the kingdom suffer. And finally, the heavy hand of God weighed him down, down, down. And this is his testimony. I finally confessed all my sin and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And oh, what a relief. My guilt is gone. My sin is confessed. It's the theme in the Bible. We know all through the New Testament. We often go to 1 John 1, 9. It, you cannot wear out this verse. You cannot overuse it if your attitude is one of sincerity and humility. Motivated by conviction. I go to my father. Not in an effort to get out of trouble. Not in an effort to, to circumvent consequences because sometimes consequences come even if we're fully forgiven but when I go and if I confess my sin to him he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness here's why you have to go into the next chapter 
My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. When we have a great need because of our relationship with Christ, we receive great grace. Maintaining a clear conscience does not mean that you should punish yourself. You do not become like the Catholics of old or, or those in other lands who will pick up a whip and then just continue to beat themselves over and over, seeking to rid themselves of their own guilt in their own power, with their own position. No, we come before the Father. We freely confess. We freely admit we make that sincere commitment that says, I do not want to be back in this same situation today or tomorrow or the next day. And when we confess, he forgives because standing right next to us is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not only the high priest, but he's also the perfect sacrifice. Well, let's look at statement number three. If you make a habit of hiding your sins, you, you will be drawn into deeper and deeper bondage. Because Satan uses that defiled conscience to lead a person into more sin. We've shared that one. But again, such an important statement of review. If we try to cover it up, our lives become more and more and more complicated. We lose more and more joy. Relationships suffer more and more because the habit of hiding your sin will absolutely wear you out and change everything in your own personal world. Here's statement four that speaks of it again. Maintaining a clear conscience motivates you to make wise decisions to take responsibility for your actions and avoid consequences of hiding your mistakes. That's the reason part of what Paul wrote um, and taught is capsulized in this statement that he sends to Timothy. Timothy is a young man by comparison. He was probably in his 40s, maybe a bit younger or older. But he was Paul's spiritual son in the faith. And he said, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. Now he's traveled with Timothy. He's had many late night conversations. He's been on long walks talking with Timothy, instructing him. And here's what he says. Here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ. Well, we know how important that is. Keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience. And as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. You probably have certain names that bubble to the surface, but we know how that works. If somebody is involved in a habit of sin, the sin is becoming overcoming. It's there all the time. It seems to win every time. And, and the Lord knows that we all have troubles with that. But in a particular situation, you may be aware of somebody who just a few years ago, perhaps just a few months ago, where they were living and, and it looked and sound genuine. There was no reason to doubt their testimony. But all of a sudden, they got involved in a sinful pattern. And instead of confessing that and coming to the Lord to be forgiven, they've continued to hide it, to justify it, to excuse it. 
and it's become more and more and more entangling and all of a sudden they have been tripped up and you look at them and now you're wondering if they're even really a Christian. How could a Christian get involved with all of those things? Well, I can understand that. Do you want to know how long it takes to ruin your life, to ruin your testimony? On average, I think it would only take about 10 seconds, right? To all of a sudden, you're in a situation that you never could have dreamed of. All of a sudden, all the things that you hold dear, you've thrown off to the side for the pleasure of one moment. And the Bible says, listen, you've got to maintain your clear conscience because of the heart being deceitful and desperately wicked. You can drift and drift and drift until your life is shipwrecked. Your faith holds no joy. It provides for you no benefits. Now, I am so thankful that God in his patience he works with us. He's promised that he will complete the work that he has started, Philippians 1.6. And many times we have watched that happen, where someone is completely broken down, and the Lord then, step by step, rebuilds vitality back into their relationship. And it's not long until they perhaps not only have a great testimony, but on many occasions, they will be involved in a great ministry. How good it is that God freely, completely forgives. <clears throat> Statement number five. <clears throat> As a Christian, unconfessed sin can make you ashamed to share your faith because you can be called a hypocrite. Oh, yes. If you have soiled your testimony before the people you work with, you live with in your home, the, the circle of friends you count as so important, if you have soiled your testimony, if you have been practicing sin without the evidence of repentance is not long until they will say and they will be completely justified in saying why should I listen to you you're nothing but a hypocrite and that's one reason Paul tells Timothy listen you cling to your faith and keep your conscience clear because that's the foundation for your ministry is having an opportunity to step into a crowd and know that you can minister, you can share a testimony, you can witness to any of them. When we were in Brazil, South America, I needed uh, to, to take a small group of believers that we had meeting and move them in to the, under a leadership of another individual, a Brazilian. So somebody had suggested somebody who had uh, I was no longer pastoring a church but was looking to get back into it and I, I went and met with him and I was talking to him and he made a statement that I thought wow I'm not sure I can make this statement he says you can go anywhere in this city and mention my name and no one will have anything bad to say about my testimony whoa we were in a city of 500,000 people how big is Fulton? I'm not so sure I'd want to put that out on the marquee. If you know that Bruce Russell is a hypocrite, please come into church and share your testimony. We'd have a full house. I wouldn't be here, but you'd have a full house that day. So, as a hypocrite, unconfessed sin can make you ashamed to share your faith because you can be called a hypocrite. Here's what Peter said about that. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. 
but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when, you, uh, when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Peter said here, if you want to be ready to witness, if you want to be ready to have an influence in the world that you're a part of, he didn't say be sure to memorize a lot of verses so that you can give those verses. He didn't say develop a very slick presentation that will back people into a corner so they won't know how to disagree with the gospel. No, he said, if you want to have an effective ministry witnessing to those people who live in your world, keep a clear conscience and then be ready with gentleness and kindness to share the truth about what Jesus did for you. What a tremendous evangelism plan. Here's how Timothy again heard the words from Paul. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Now think about the, the level ground that Paul has put those three on. We know the, the value of a pure heart. We know the value, the eternal value of a genuine faith. And right on that same level he says, and here's something else, a clear conscience. But some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. Aaron, is it possible for you to get my theme song ready? It might be everybody's theme, theme song by the time I get done. But here's what we have in the way of a conclusion. Jesus said to his disciples right before he was going to Calvary, he said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We know that's true. What keeps me from becoming involved in people's lives is this fear that they might know who I really am. That's why it's so important for us when we have failed and we know that that will be often Sometimes the failure will be so incredible that people will, will wonder how did it ever happen. But when we fail, we need to be quick to clear our conscience, which means there will be times when we need to go to somebody and say, I am so sorry for the attitude that I've had towards you. I am so sorry about the things I said to you or about you. I am so sorry of what I did to you. I want you to know that I have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit of just how wrong this is. I have brought it before the Father and I have confessed it and he has forgiven me, but I need to come to you and do the same. I need to confess my sin and ask you to forgive me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever felt any more humbled by any experience like the humility that comes with that experience? To come and say, I am so sorry. I was wrong. I don't have an excuse. Will you forgive me? But when we keep a clear conscience at the priority of what's important, then people will sense what Jesus said here. Hey, people will know you by your love. One final word here, Proverbs 28, 13, and this is just one of so many verses we could choose. People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. 
I know I've played it often. You may think, I don't even like the song. But it's a good song for a time of reflection. Would you listen again to Morgan Cryer as he sings, What Sin? Because it would be a terrible thing. <clears throat> it would be a terrible thing if we sat here, read these verses, considered the importance, the power that is is in a clear conscience and walked out of here without confessing what the Holy Spirit has been convicting you of. The very first step is you turn to your Heavenly Father and you say, Father, you know how long I've been dealing with this conviction. You know how long I have been wrestling today. No one else can see, no one else can know what's happening in your heart. But today, in a response to the conviction of God's Holy Spirit, if you confess your sin and forgive it because of the great work of your sacrifice, because of the great work of your high priest, because of the great work of your advocate, you can know that your sins are completely forgiven. So, take a moment to reflect might want to listen to the words, you might need to bow your heads, but listen to the, the great message in this song entitled, What Sin?